Um, I'm, my name is John Stokes. I'm Director of Tree Science and Research for all the Tree Council. And today is part of National Plant Health Week. And National Plant Health Week was born out of the International Year of Plant Health back in 2020. Uh, and it's a designated week of action to try and raise public awareness and engagement on how to keep all our plants healthy. And it's an exciting opportunity to celebrate our plants and contribute towards being the first generation to actually try to leave the environment in a better condition than we found it. Although National Plant Health Week is led by DEFRA, it is in fact a collaborative effort of our whole range, 20 organisations uh, like ourselves and the Royal Horticultural Society and the Horticultural Trades Association. And we all work together to try and reach as large an audience as we can and communicate this vital message that we really need to keep our plants healthy if we're, if we're to thrive. And so in, in each day in the week, there's a key set of messages, there's a key set of important topics, and there's the benefits that we can encourage society to enjoy and how they can protect their plants. And if, and if you want more information, please do visit the Plant Health Action website. And, and in fact, today is, is uh, Thursday the 12th, but it's also International Plant Health Day, the first ever International Plant Health Day within the structure of the um, of the week. So Charles and I are delighted to be part of the first International Plant Health Day uh, across the globe. And earlier on today, uh, the Chief Plant Health Officer, Nicola Spence, um, did, a, did an event uh, to raise the profile of trees on the global stage. So it is really exciting that this is part of a, a worldwide movement to try and improve the state of our, our plant health. So many of you know me, as I say, I'm John from the Tree Council, uh, but Charles, I'm joined tonight by Dr. Charles Lane, and Charles is a mycologist who joined uh, the UK Plant Health Service back in 1993. We've been working together for almost you know, a very long time, Charles and I have both been doing this. Um, and he spent, he spent nearly 30 years identifying new and unusual fungi uh, and looking at how they spread around the UK. And particularly over the last 10 years, Charles has been building on the capability and the capacity in plant health for biosecurity across, across the industry, across the, the charity organisations, and working with um, uh, DEFRA on behalf of FERA, which is the Food and Environment Research Agency that Charles, uh, Charles works within. He's also, he's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology and a senior plant health professional. It's the sort of badge I would only aspire to, Charles. <laughs> and he's a professional member of the Arb Association. And um, when Charles is not doing that in his spare time, he volunteers at the Yorkshire Arboretum as part of their local tree health centre. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk to you about how we can all take action in this important week, how we can all take action for healthy trees. Um, and I am now going to pass, this, pass this, the presentation over to Charles, who is going to take us through, whoops, just give me two seconds, Charles, I'm gonna get this off ready. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> through the presentation. Perfect. Uh, and hopefully, is that displaying in full screen mode? I can see, uh, it's not in full screen for me, but it may be for other people watching. That worried me that it might not be. Um, just give me two seconds. Let's see if this works better. How about now? Uh, still not for me, but... Uh, Blimey. Sorry, folks. The wonders of modern technology. You can it may it. be that others can see it in full screen. I think it flashed up there, John, so... Here we go. There we are. That should have done it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much, John. And it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. It's a, it's a fantastic week to be involved. Uh, I've always been passionate about trees. Uh, when I was a, a young student, I was taken to Thetford Forest and shown around Thetford Forest by a, a forest pathologist. And I always thought anybody who took a axe to work must have a good job. Um, I spent many years not working in trees. I'm actually the Young Mushroom Scientist of the Year, 1993, and it's taken me 20 years to finally get into tree health. Um, so it's really about sharing my experience about working plant health and biosecurity, um, but also working in the diagnosis of ill health of trees. Um, so if we just jump onto the next slide, John, if that's all right. 
Um, so I'll take you back to 2012 when ash dieback was found for the first time in the natural environment. Uh, and it was in the laboratory at Ferrer uh, where I work, where we did all the identification for that national survey. But that really led to sort of quite a major sort of rethink and revision of tree health and the way that we manage trees. Start off with the expert task force. Uh, then the uh, tree health management plan. And then for me, the document which was the most sort of significant was the publication of the plant biosecurity strategy in 2014. This is an excellent document. It sort of lays out how we thought about plant health in 2014 and really has helped sort of reshape the way we think about plant health. Uh, I, as you find out in the next slide, they're actually we're in the process of uh, refreshing the new GB plant health strategy. Uh, and I use the royal we there. This is a DEFRA's responsibility, but we're all part of that sort of community working to build that new GB strategy. So that is actually going to be published uh, in the forthcoming months. It's been slightly held up because of COVID, um, but we're expecting this to come out, I think, sort of July time. Um, and it's building on the sort of really good uh, framework of the first GB strategy in 2014. And it's going to be based around these four outcomes, a world class biosecurity regime, a society that values healthy plants, a biosecure plant supply chain and an enhanced technical capability. And I think we'd all recognize those as really important elements of actually having a really top notch biosecurity uh, in this country. So if we just jump on to the next slide, John, please. Um, one of the things that came out of the first GB strategy was the fact that we needed to share knowledge, information uh, in a reciprocal way. We need to share the science that we were doing and we needed to hear from stakeholders. So one of the best outcomes, I think, of the uh, GB strategy in 2014, not only do we now have a chief plant health officer, but we also have a UK plant health risk register. Uh, this lists all the quarantine organisms, which we're familiar with. There were probably about 300 of those. But actually, as part of that process, we identified all the other new and emerging pests and pathogens. I think when it was published in 2014, it was about eight to 900. I think we're now in ex ex excess of 1,200 different pests and pathogens that we're aware of internationally and that we have concern about. And these are risk rated by DEFRA. They're given a score between one to 125, and those of the greatest priority will have the highest score. This is in the public domain. Anybody can access the information. It's an excellent resource. You can type the common name in, you can type in the scientific name of both the host or the pest or the pathogen, and it will draw up all the information that you want to. So it's an excellent way of finding out what is out there. Uh, so if you're going to plant a particular range of genera and you want to find out what the particular problems might be, this is a great starting point. In the next slide, we'll see those organisms which are of the greatest concern. So this is in the new uh, EU regulation that we're working to, which is the UK priority pests. So you can see uh, there is probably about 20 different priority pests in the UK on plants and trees. Those in yellow are those which occur on trees. So you can see a large proportion of the organisms that we're greatly concerned about uh, are actually on trees. And you'll recognize things in there like oak processionary moth and pine processionary moth. And then there's a, a, a second set, if we look in the next slide, John. This is a, a, a project that I work on called Observatory which is a citizen science project. It's led by Forest Research. Uh, our volunteers are managed uh, by the Woodland Trust, and I'm one of the scientific advisors on that. And again, you can see here is a, a range of different priority pests and pathogens, which we think are suitable for citizen science and our volunteers are looking for. Now, some of those organisms you may be more familiar with, sadly, things like horse chestnut leaf miner. Um, sadly, that was introduced about 20 years ago, is now quite prevalent in England and Wales, although its distribution in Scotland is still rather unknown. And we've got things like ash dye back in there and emerald ash borer. So we have a nice mix and range of different organisms uh, which we are concerned about. And these are some of the most important uh, pests and pathogens that are impacting the country now and potentially could impact in the future. If we go on to look in the next slide, please, John, just I wanted to talk about two of those different organisms. You might think it's rather retrospective to talk about ash dye, uh, dash, not dash dieback, but ash dieback. Been there, done that. We know everything we think we need to know about ash dieback. 
But I think ash dieback really is a very important organism. It has demonstrated what can happen to this generation. It's not potato blight. It's not Dutch elm disease. It actually affects our generation now and here. We can see what happens when you introduce an, in, an invasive non-native species to a country. So the disease was first recognized in Europe in the 1990s, and we had our first record in 2012. And that was the whole uh, initiative and drive behind the, the refresh and review of uh, plant health and biosecurity and um, there are a large number of sites unfortunately affected with ash dieback now it's a fungal disease and um, it goes by the uh, scientific name of hymenocyphus fraxineus sometimes it might be known as calara ash dieback as well it is a serious disease of fraxinus that occurs across a wide range of different fraxinus species and where it actually originated in uh, china and asia it's a relatively harmless disease but where it has been introduced into europe um, it has been absolutely devastating. And unfortunately, I suspect we're all familiar with the symptoms of ash dieback, as you can see in this slide here. Probably the first thing I would certainly look at uh, young saplings, and you're going to see the dieback. Looks a little bit like witch's fingers, I always think, rather skinny and no leaves at all. Wilting, dieback. The most most diagnostic and characteristic feature I would recommend you always look for uh, is where you get the insertion of a branch into the main stem and you get that very characteristic diamond shaped lesion. So I suspect we're all quite familiar with diagnosing ash dieback on young plants. With mature plants, much more difficult. We can't get up close and personal. Um, there are also um, ash is very prone to uh, an abiotic disease called ash decline, um, which can be very problematic and cause similar symptoms. So if you are looking at mature mature ash trees and you want to know whether it's got ash dieback, look for the regeneration growth underneath. And if that shows symptoms, I think you could be relatively more comfortable that you may have ash dieback. So ash dieback is still a very important disease, it's still causing a huge amount of damage, and we're now learning to live with it. The threat in the next slide, which is still really uh, of concern to ash, John, if we can just jump on. Oh, sorry, this is the distribution I've jumped to quickly. We'll go back one, John. Thank you, well done. Um, and this is just looking at the distribution. You can see on the, the dark blue colors where the, where, where the disease was first found in 2012, down the eastern seaboard. And as you can see, the colors move into, uh, pink, into pinks and reds and greens. You can see that we are still finding new records of ash dieback, and we're seeing a steady westward and north than distribution. But out there, there are still many UK grid squares where we don't know where ash dieback is. There's no doubt that it is there, but it would be great if you ever see ash dieback in any of those grid squares to report that through tree alert, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about. So ash dieback is still relevant and it is still interesting, but it is a particular concern when we think about fractionless and ash in the next slide. When we talk about this really, really nasty, uh, potentially invasive pest, it's called the emerald ash borer. It's an absolutely beautiful beetle. And that's quite difficult for me to say as a pathologist because I don't really find insects particularly interesting, but this is absolutely beautiful. They're called jewel beetles, emerald green in color. They're sort of D-shaped. So it's not surprising as, as the beetle bores out from underneath the bark, it produces rather characteristic D-shaped exit hole. And that is what it's looking for. But the damage as we see in the next slide is actually due to the larval stage we jump on yeah so here is the larval stage that lives underneath the bark and it causes these beautiful sinuous galleries underneath the bark and the whole time it's doing that it's killing the living tissue and therefore you get cankers and dieback and you get some very serious dieback which as you can see in the next slide these are actually slides taken from uh, Russia um, because although the pest originally occurs from Asia, it was uh, accidentally introduced into Russia and is slowly spreading, uh, is slowly spreading uh, in Russia. Um, and these are the characteristic symptoms. You'll see very dead trees. As I mentioned, they girdle the stem. But the ash tree is desperately trying to regrow, and you get this sort of lovely, like a little ballerina's dress frill at the base of the tree, which is called epicormic shoots. And this is characteristic of emerald ash borer. Now, one of the things that we know, emerald ash borer was accidentally introduced into North America, where it was declared as the most uh, invasive and damaging species ever to be introduced into North America. It has killed tens, if not hundreds of millions of trees in North America. Now, they don't have ash dieback, the fungal disease. They only have emerald ash borer. But the way to find emerald ash borer in North America is to ring bark the stem of a tree. 
um, and because the emerald ash borer will selectively feed on a dead and dying tree. Um, so actually we potentially have the perfect storm. We have a large proportion of ash trees in this country which are weakened and under stress due to ash dieback. If the emerald ash borer was to be accidentally introduced, then it would be absolutely catastrophic and even worse than the current situation. So that's a really useful reminder of how an invasive species um, can actually cause a huge amount of damage. We just look on the next slide. Uh, this is a new threat. I thought it'd be quite interesting just to bring in a, a new disease. This is actually a nematode, uh, Lichelenchus crenata. Um, and this again, it causes very nasty uh, foliar symptoms, as you can see in the picture there. The main thing there is on a uh, beech, so on phagus species. You're looking at the intervenal, so the green tissue between the veins. Can you see how dark green that is to the relative to the rest of the leaf? That is due to a nematode feeding in the leaf and the bud. Uh, causing that intervenal uh, damage and uh, uh, harm. Um, the disease was originally thought to occur in Japan, um, but again, it has somehow arrived in uh, North America and it's actually a different species. So we have a new species of Lichelenchus in North America, and it's done a huge amount of damage around the sort of, uh, um, the sort of uh, Northeast area of America and Canada. This is a disease uh, caused by nematode. We're particularly concerned about. It doesn't occur in Europe, and we're desperately trying to keep it out. So again, this is a project that we're working with observatory, European partners, and the International Plant Central Network to prevent the introduction of this disease by encouraging you to look for it. So any symptoms of potentially of beech leaf disease should be reported through Tree Alert. Um, so if we jump onto the next slide, John. Again, if there aren't enough out there, um, I thought it'd be quite interesting to uh, think about some of the other new and emerging threats. Uh, Phytophthora pluvialis is a very nasty disease that has recently been found in the UK. It was found in Cornwall, has been found on a number of occasions on uh, hemlock, causes nasty stem cankers and uh, foliar dieback. In the middle, another agrilla species, again, remember that D-shaped exit hole, characteristic symptom present in Eastern Asia and Russia. Uh, and this time it's on poplar and salix. Uh, and again, all these organisms, we would take statutory action against them to destroy them and eradicate them. And then because it is International Plant Health Day, I thought it'd be really nice to introduce you to an international threat. Uh, this is the pine tortoise scale, a completely unpronounceable scientific name to a pathologist, so I'm not going to embarrass myself. But this is very interesting. This disease, this uh, pest was found by my colleague, Chris Malumphy, who works for the UK Overseas Territories, and he has a hard job. He was out in the West Indies in the Turks and Caicos, and this particular scale insect has absolutely destroyed the native pine, pine, pine species in the Turks and Caicos. Um, huge, huge impact. Um, much to our great surprise, it was found in Italy in 2015, and then recently has been found in France. This is a potentially very damaging disease. We're not sure the impact it would be on our native species of pines, but again, it just illustrates the amount of potential threat there is, so we need to be particularly careful. So we just jump onto the next slide, John. So I think one of the things that's really important, I've talked to you about some of these really interesting and emerging problems, it's really important that we actually report these accurately. So if we jump onto the next slide. Um, I think one of the things that came out of the uh, ash dieback um, uh, problem in 2012 was actually a recognition that we need a central reporting mechanism for these early warning systems. Uh, and this is an excellent uh, piece of work that's led by Forest Research. It's called Tree Alert in Great Britain and Tree Check in Northern Ireland. And this allows our statutory services, our national plant protection organizations, our volunteers from organizations, uh, from stakeholders and citizens to all put their data all into one place. All that information goes to Forest Research and then they can make the right sort of decision about the type of response. So if it was a finding of horse chestnut leaf miner in England, it's an interesting finding, but it wouldn't really result in great statutory action. If it was a finding of the emerald ash borer, um, there would be much uh, concern and there would be an immediate response. So it's a very good way of encouraging everybody to contribute and everybody to uh, be able to respond uh, reactively to that. And if you just jump to the next slide, John, here's further details. So this is how you can help. Check your local trees, report your sightings, use a tree alert and keep yourself well informed. So that really is just a, a very quick rapid review through some of the emerging threats, some of the pests and pathogens and how you might record and report. Now, John asked me specifically to, to use my experience. 
as a diagnostician. So we just jump onto the next slide, John. So I think one of the things I've learned over the years is um, I get sent many pictures. I often get phoned up. You know, I've got a tree. It looks a little bit sick. Next door neighbors, people in the village, when I'm out and about, I'm constantly being asked, why is this tree looking sick? Now, I've spent 20 years in a laboratory diagnosing uh, plant and, and tree health problems. And I think, I think the most important thing that I recognize is actually on very few occasions is it actually due to a pest or pathogen. It's in normally due to cultural and environmental situation. So we just jump onto the next slide. And this is an absolute classic for anybody who has studied plant science and plant health. This is called the disease triangle, and it appears in many different formats. I've slightly tweaked it um, to say that damage and symptoms, the damage and symptoms that you see in the field at that time is influenced by three different elements. Host will be the first thing. Some species are susceptible to pests and pathogens. Some are a little more tolerant and some are resistant. So the type of host will affect the amount of damage that you see in the field. The actual organism that you're dealing with, some pathogens, there are different strains as we've seen with ash dieback, for example. Some of them are more pathogenic than others. And importantly, the environment is very important in influencing the symptoms you see. Some of the fungal species, for example, like damp, humid, wet conditions. So if we have a very wet spring, you're likely to see more damage. It may be a, an organism that prefers a dry uh, wood. And again, if we have a drought season, you may see more damage. So whenever you think about the symptoms that you are seeing, think about the host, think about the environment, and think about which different uh, pest or pathogen you're, you're dealing with. So if we go on to the next slide, John, again, these are really important for me. These are the three things that I ask first. Um, I always ask about the uh, sort of horticultural appropriateness of what has been planting. It's a phrase you hear all the time, right tree, right, right plant, right place, sorry. And it really is very important indeed. Uh, and this is something that, you know, I'm sure John and the tree council and your colleagues, you really get this. This is so, so important. I think the other thing is, is about sustained aftercare as well. You know, we've seen a lot of emphasis and a lot of drive about tree planting. Planting is the first step in the process. I feel it's like bringing up a child. Once that child is born, you don't just leave it. I mean, my children are 20 odd and I'm still looking after them. So, you know, once the job is done, it's not just about of, of giving birth to that child. You have many years to look after. So sustained aftercare is absolutely critical. I think cultural factors are really important as well. I think sometimes we forget about the soil condition and the type, and particularly in urban settings, I think it's really important to think about compaction issues as well. This is a beautiful planting scheme that was put into uh, Hull as the uh, International Year of Culture a few years ago, and you can see all the hard landscaping around it. So we can start thinking about all the impacts upon those poor plants that have been put in there, frequently put in, in a rush, and frequently the contractor runs away and leaves them for someone else to look after so always think about the soil type and particularly think about compaction because that is going to influence the nutrient uptake and the water availability too much or too little it's not the goldilocks just right that we want environmental factors are absolutely critical as i showed you in that disease triangle it's really important so again think about light think particularly about overshading um, think about too much light, so it might be scorched. Think about temperature. Again, similar sort of factors. Have they dried out? Has it been a very hot year? Has it been a very cold year? Think about water relations, too much, too little, or Goldilocks right? Pollution factors, again, urban settings, this is going to be a major problem. Uh, and then also protection from damage whether this is uh, rabbits, whether it is deer, whether it is sheep, um, or whether it is uh, children and people um, moving plants around. There are so many reasons why plants can be damaged. So always before you think about a problem, think about you know, the horticultural, the cultural and the environmental factors. And me as a diagnostician sat in the laboratory, I can't gather any of that information. So it's so important as uh, tree wardens that you have that local knowledge and you can bring that to the uh, diagnosis. So if we just move on to the next slide, please, John. So here's some really good examples. Again, thinking about uh, landscaping, you know, this is an example here of a, of a tree being planted. 
uh, in, a, in a good example in the top right hand side and a poor example in the bottom left hand side. The one in the bottom left hand side uh, was some rather poor quality landscaping work that was done outside my laboratory and that tree is no longer there, it dead and died. They basically scraped the surface of the plants off, uh, put chippings down, it looked beautiful for the visit and then everything died. So thinking about the, you know, think about those previous land use, thinking about compaction. Um, salt runoff is another really good example. Me sat in the laboratory or the end of a phone, I don't know any of this information. And this is really good information for you to gather as part of your assessment of tree health. If we look at the next slide, please, John. Again, this is this poor tree. You can see how uh, unhealthy it looks. It's no longer there. Um, again, you will have that local knowledge. I will often say, you know, this could be drought. And go, no, it's never been droughted. I might say it's frost. Do you know when those frost is? You have all that local knowledge, and it is frequently with uh, heat and extremes of light and temperature, um, water flooding, drought, the same sort of issues. Your local knowledge is absolutely key here. If we jump onto the next slide, please, John. Uh, again, all the same sort of issues. I think one, again, particularly in uh, urban settings, I think we've become far, far more aware of the importance of, solu vo of soil volume and how much actually root space those specific trees comes back to that great issue about right tree in the right place. Again, I'm always very conscious of compaction and paths and roads. If we move on again, John. And again, this is where your local knowledge is absolutely so important. I always feel that if you've got a slow, steady decline in a plant's health, this is less likely to be a sudden invasive plant pest or pathogen. So if you see a plant slowly decline, it's probably more likely to be a cultural or environmental factor. If you see a plant suddenly change in its health, to my mind, that would suggest there has been an invasive um, plant or pest uh, actually come into the area. So again, how long have the symptoms and damage been there? When did you first see them? Is it getting fur? Is it getting worse? And how fast is it getting worse? So again, your local knowledge. Every time, every time you take your dogs out for a walk, you take your kids to the park, you'll walk past the same trees. You are the best eyes and ears for actually carrying out that tree house surveillance. You will know when things have changed. I just see a snapshot sat in the laboratory. So again, your local knowledge, absolutely vital here. And if we just jump on again, please, John. Again, that local knowledge, you know, you will know what's on, talk to local managers, owners, talk to colleagues, talk to other people who may be visiting their plants. I'm always interested to know what they think the problem might be. Before I proffer opinion and make myself look foolish, which I have done on several occasions, and suggest it could be, um, I suggested in one occasion it could be frost damage, uh, and then I found out the tree was in Australia. Um, so I always listen first and ask questions second, um, because your local knowledge is so, so valuable. So, you know, don't be shy, come forward. But you can help us in trying to identify tree health problems by thinking about some of those predeposing factors before you actually think about pests and pathogens. And if we just go on again, please, John. Um, so again, this is, I appreciate it's a real whiz through. Um, but again, I mentioned the observatory project. Um, I've done some videos on there about how to assess the condition of a tree. They're all freely available. There's some excellent resources on there. And I take you through the same process of trying to identify um, the issues that might be affecting the health of a tree. Uh, and if I'm right in thinking, John, I think there's one more slide for me or am I over to you? Uh, and so, so, so we, as a diagnostician, I think the most important thing if you're trying to identify the health of a tree is to use a systematic approach. Um, you're always often drawn in to see the exciting pest or pathogen and the most damaging symptoms. But if you're trying to communicate with someone to give you advice, that systematic approach, I am just as interested to know what is healthy as is unhealthy. And I think John has an excellent example and he's going to take over now. Thank you, Charles. Um, and so, and so, building upon all the work that Charles uh, is doing has done, uh, we've been looking for ways that we can help you to to do this stuff. So, um, uh, Sam, who who leads uh, the Tree Warden Network nationally now, has been working up uh, another training module, which is on uh, identification of plant health and using sort of internationally recognised best practice and using all the stuff that Charles has has just articulated. 
we've come up with a, a module which will be available soon, which sets out that process. And as you saw from Charles, we start with the surroundings, you know, all of those questions that are there that he's posed about what's going on. And then you look at the foliage and the branches and the trunk and the base of the tree. And that, that module will be coming out soon. Um, but as Charles said, uh, your eyes and ears are invaluable nationally, locally in that journey. So we've been working with Observatory to start a, a new tweaked version of the Observatory volunteer scheme, particularly for tree wardens, which we're actually launching tomorrow as part of Plant Health uh, Week, uh, which it, particularly in the Southeast, um, because we're piloting it this year rather than going fully national this year. But next year, if we get the, the principles right, working with Charles, we should be in a, in a position. And it is using that eyes and ears and taking that walk and noticing what's going on. And there will be more information about that because we're working this through with Charles and the others uh, over the next six months, just to get it right before we roll it out to everybody. But it is part of, of the journey that Charles has outlined. And why it matters is that the climate is changing and in that changing climate and the movement of plants that you've heard from Charles, we, we get greater stress on our trees. And the greater the stress, the more the potential that the trees have to suffer, to be unhealthy. Um, and we are, we're here to try and get as many trees as we can to be healthy. And that requires you to be engaged at every part of the journey of a tree's life, just spotting the pests, the diseases, the problems, but also thinking about the beginning of the journey, the start of the whole process. And the start of the whole process is always, if you're planting a tree, the young tree where are you going to buy it from where has it come from what conditions has it had in the nursery what has happened to that tree before you get it makes a huge difference to its chances of being healthy and as a general rule of thumb these days you, you cannot have failed to see it there is a huge push to get everybody to think about buying trees from biosecure nurseries and ideally and you know, from, from British nurseries, Tree Council hasn't bought anything from abroad, abroad for years because we want to, to reduce those risks of bringing in pests and diseases from, from abroad. And therefore you need to think, where am I buying from? What have they got? What have they done? Uh, and this is a, a new tree nursery that's been set up by Leeds City Council, um, dealing with its own plants for the city looking at, at its own biosecurity, managing its own biosecurity, which is fantastic. And David's got a question, which we will come back to David later in the Q&A at the end about some of those issues about buying and tree nurseries. And we'll, we'll take that as a live question towards the end. But once you've acquired your trees, you've got to plant them. You've got to plant them properly. And I'm sorry for those of you that have been around with us for years, you know, I've been on this same journey for 30 years. We've still got to get the basics right. We've still got to get the tree properly planted with the right levels of protection, with the right types of protection, with the aftercare that it needs. And you heard from Charles the importance of those environmental conditions. Well, you are the people planting the tree. You have the responsibility to make sure that we are planting these things in the right way, in the proper places and give them the greatest chances. And I still am appalled. <laughs> there is no other word. I am still appalled when I see aftercare that's not happened, when you see trees in tubes that are suffering, that have not been looked after properly. Um, and there has been a huge movement over the last few years to move away from plastic tubes into other sorts of tubes to reduce not only the threats to the tree but also to reduce the plastic that we're putting into the environment but whichever sort of tube you use this is this is not acceptable this should not have got to this state that aftercare that Charles so eloquently described as as helping your progeny to grow up properly it has not been done you need to do all of those all of those things because otherwise they die and this is a really really silly one this is a holly. These tubes were never designed for holly. They hate hot, damp microclimates that this tube creates. And so what happens? Stick a holly in a plastic tube, 
it dies. That is not rocket science, but people still do it. And we shouldn't, we should be doing the job properly. And to get healthy trees, we need to treat them all really carefully and make sure that they grow properly from day one. Of course, once a tree gets older and particularly with that changing climate, um, we need to think as Charles has said about ground, the, you know, what happens in the soil, in the ground. Now a mature tree, if it's established in the right place, will find the water that it needs. It will find the capacity. And so truthfully, there isn't any way that anybody could ever water a big tree with enough buckets to give it the chance to make it survive. When it's smaller, of course, they need that chance. But you've got to get the tree to establish in the site that it grows and it will then develop a healthy crown for that place. And as long as nothing changes, and exactly as Charles has identified, you know, those environmental conditions around it, if they change, then you might start to see some changes in the canopy. So spotting that, dealing with that, identifying what may be happening long before it actually becomes a major problem. The number of times you see, um, you see trees where people pile extra soil around or they chuck all their rubbish around the base of the tree or they pile things and compress the ground, it still happens. And we can't always do anything about it, but there are occasions when you can. When you can, you, sh you should try to do something to reduce those stresses, which mean that the tree stays healthy and the pests and diseases are not as easy to get a hold. And we need still to innovate. Um, we've been doing an experiment with Network Rail for the last four years on a piece of railway line um, in North London. And these pictures show this was Friday, two, you know, uh, Friday of last week. They show the experiment that we've been trialing. And uh, we've got multiple replicates going across the site with all sorts of different treatments. But the first box here is natural regeneration. We, we just let it regenerate on its own. Stuck a fence around it as we did with all of them, keep the deer out and naturally regenerated. And after four years, we have brambles. We might have a few other things underneath, but we can't see them because of the brambles. So we, our test point is at five years. Um, I'm hoping there will be some, but they're not quite visible yet. Picture number two is an area that was planted by contractors. They were not under supervision, um, but they had been given a brief. The height of those trees is now one metre after four years and we have about a 60% survival rate. Uh, not good, um, and only a meter in height. Here we have a hedge planted from seed. Uh, the seed was, we were told, would have a 95% failure rate. We've had a 95% survival rate, the upshot of which is there are so many plants, it's gonna be interesting how they compete with each other as it grows over the next few years. But the height of that seeded hedge is now the same as the area that has been planted. Um, uh, uh, sorry, Claire's telling me that I should say top left and bottom left. So um, uh, bottom left picture. So top, top, top left was, uh, um, top left was the area, this area, top left was the area that was from seed, sorry, from natural regeneration. Contractor planted top right, bottom left planted by seed, metre high, um, really dense, really healthy. Bottom right planted by volunteers under supervision. Height of the thing is now two metres going on three metres and I've got 100% survival. So if you want healthy trees, doing it well by people who care about it with passion uh, is gives you a potentially much greater chance on the basis of this trial than if you do it by any other means. You get a denser, quicker hedge than you've done by any of the other means. But I am really intrigued what will happen in the seeded hedge over the next few years, because if we get this right, this is a lot cheaper and has the, the potential to be a lot more effective. And after all, in the end, nature did it by seed. So we're just enhancing what nature does naturally. We've just got to do it right. And there are some interesting lessons there that we're still learning. So if we want to get 
to the next generation of healthy trees and a healthy tree has to be one that survives. So a thousand year old tree by definition has to be healthy. We have to give them the greatest chance. We have to um, grow them properly, experiment about how we're doing it, make sure it works. Think about the species mix and make sure that that's covered. This is an avenue, but every single tree in this line of trees is a different species to stop a disease from getting hold and taking out the whole avenue. We have to test those practices that we've done and just say, is this right for the new world that we're in? And what could I do that might be different to get those healthy trees? But if we get it right, we can produce genuinely healthy trees. And this was again last Friday, I just put it in the tree, the tree here in the middle, um, the beech tree is one I actually planted myself 30 years ago. Um, which proves that you can sit in the shade of something in your own lifetime if you start early enough. But if you don't, if you start whenever, it will be somebody's shade if we do it properly. And the nice part about this is we're just about to introduce um, a forest school under the shadow of a tree that I actually planted 30 years ago, which for me is fantastic because we've got a healthy tree producing something that future generations will enjoy. So what we tried to do this, after, this evening is to give you that sense of how you can healthy. And it's all about, as Charles has said, eyes and ears and observation and a little bit of biosecurity. And the little bits of biosecurity that you should think about are these. You should never bring anything back. Don't, just don't, just don't do it. Full stop, end of. Don't bring anything back um, because the risks are too great. Buy safely. Think about where your, your trees are coming from. Think about where they, they, they've grown. Make sure that you've done your own biosecurity checks and policies that you think, I am comfortable to buy these trees. And as, as Charles said, if you spot anything, feed into the national system that's collecting all this data and put it on tree alert so that we can all benefit from your eyes and ears. And as a nation, we just get better at spotting stuff. So that's the presentation. And what Charles and I thought we would do for our last part is just give you, before we ask, let you answer any questions, is, is just give you an example of how Charles's life works. So one of you might send a photograph and Charles will get this photograph and then will be said, what's wrong with my tree? So Charles, Tell me what you see. In that. Yeah, so this was a photograph I got sent some time ago. So um, first thing, obviously, think about what's the uh, setting. So it's obviously a, a parkland tree. Um, there's obviously quite a lot of lot. There's quite a lot of livestock underneath the tree. So as soon as I start thinking about livestock, I start thinking about damage. So you can see a flattening. So there's a browse line. But also when the weather's poor, a lot of livestock will go underneath trees um, and they'll also get a lot of sort of green manure under the trees. And that can cause a lot of phytophthora problems. They can also um, sort of rub the bark and cause damage. So if I see a lot of livestock around trees, that can be an issue. Um, bottom right hand corner, I can just see there's a bit of a road in there as well. Um, so I can see a little bit of grey in there, which suggests to me there is a path. So, you know, is there some sort of compaction problem? Do they salt that road? So again, I'm starting to think about the sort of cultural environmental factors. Uh, and then instantly, of course, I, I'm drawn to the top of the crown. I can see that there's leaf loss in there. So there's a foliar problem there. Why might the leaves fall off? Is that possibly a drought problem? Um, so could that tie back into compaction? Could that tie back into the road? Um, could it be some kind of uh, insect feeding on the foliage? Um, my, tree limited, my tree knowledge is limited, but I'm pretty sure that's a horse chestnut tree. As soon as I think horse chestnut, I instantly start thinking about bleeds on the stem of the trunk. So I'd want to go in and look at the uh, base of the stem uh, and uh, see whether it's got any phytophthora or any bacterial bleed on it. Um, when I first saw this, I thought it was quite uh, sickly uh, and I got quite excited, but I think John has a different view on it. So John, what, what do you see as a professional tree person as opposed to a pathologist? So from, from my perspective, you have a tree that is, that is slightly declining in the crown, but it's producing a vast amount of flowers. That's usually a sign of good health or it's a sign of extreme sickness because a tree does tend to produce a lot of flowers in its last in its terminal stages, it wants to produce 
um, progeny at the last point, but this one looks, looks really healthy to me. Um, yeah. The crown dieback that's happening at the top is, a, is often a part of a natural, we call it retrenchment in the tree world, where the tree just cuts off water to the upper parts because it hasn't got access to enough water. And that, Charles, that's where your thoughts about the sheep, the compaction, all of that stuff that's happening under the tree makes me think that that's a, probably a compaction issue in a parkland where it's just not getting enough water. So that one wouldn't worry me particularly. That one would be one I would watch over a number of years and just see how it changed. So how about this one then, Charles? This is a, Charles hasn't seen this one. Let's see what Charles reads of this one. What do you see when you see this one, Charles? Oh dear, I'm being put on the spot, aren't I? So the first thing I think, I'm, I, it sounds I'm a bit obsessed, but I can see a road. I just see roads everywhere. So on the left-hand side, I can see a tarmac road. On the right-hand side, I can see a path. So I'm instantly starting the same issues around compaction. I'm thinking the same issues around salting. Um, I'm guessing it's a beach. Um, because there's a lot of dead brown leaves on the floor. Well, I mean, that would suggest to me it's a beach. Um, I can see a smooth stem um, and I can see quite a lot of uh, a lot of the root flares are exposed. Um, so I'm guessing this is a beach. I'd probably want to go and look for phytophthora problems. There's quite a large sort of indent at the base of the stem, sort of fluted, which again might mean is that old damage? Uh, it's, you know, is that physical damage? And then there's a lot of white, uh, what looks like a deposit on the surface of the stem. Um, I have um, a possible theory there, and it's one I have been caught out with before, got very excited about, I think it's a pest or pathogen. Um, it's just lime wash, that someone's just um, lime washed the tree because either they don't want to hit it in the dark, or they're playing some kind of game, um, or it's some kind of marker point. So whenever I see a white deposit on that, but guessing it's beach then i'm thinking it might be beach scale so i'm sort of thinking it's somewhere between beach scale or john trying to trip me up with um lime wash so i'm i'm i'm, I'm not going to tell you which one it is because i'm not going to commit on this one is that all right that's 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 a really good call charles and for those of you that um for those of you that well, what we were trying to do was just explain the thought process that we go through when we see these things so what Charles articulated there was the perfect description of that tree. David Carey, who's on the call, was actually with me when we took this photograph. Uh, it's in a park in Kent. Um, it's quite an old beech tree, hence the flares, hence the shapes, all the things that you've identified. Charles, it's by a road. It is a bit compacted, but the um, but the white is is beech scale, which is a which is an insect um, that is spreading around Kent, and it's the sort of thing that that doesn't. Um, instantly draw the eye but it is the sort of thing that we need reporting if people spot it let's try a couple more and then we'll just go to questions Charles. <coughs> um let's try this one uh so this i'm guessing is a pine um it's rather thin looking looking at the surroundings it's obviously in a parkland or an arboretum in a collection uh there's a broadleaf tree next to it you know the thing that really stands out for me is on the left hand side that is a very characteristic uh, symptom. It's called a lion's tail. Um, and I know that is a characteristic feature of red band needle blight. It's a fungal disease that kills the second, third and fourth year old needles. And you're left with those beautiful sort of like, little like candelabras or lion's tail. The other thing is also you tend to get damage on the lower part of the stem uh, and on the upper part of the crown where the humidity is lower and the air flows better and the foliage is dry. So you can see that environmental impact. Um, then actually you're less likely to get disease. So I'm confident this is red band needle blight, John. Tell me otherwise. You are 100% you are correct, Charles. That is red band needle blight. Um, and the last one of these just, just is this one. Yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting one. I remember when uh, the BBC were first filming Ash Dieback, and they didn't actually know what ash dieback looked. So I used to watch the news and watch these beautiful lichens on ash trees. Absolutely stunning. This looks like one of those weird things that you sometimes see on trees. Um, it could be algal, could be a rust from a sort of like a rusty tar spot. It looks rather bright and orangey to me. I've seen them in pink, green and blue. And I suspect there's someone who's gone out and spray canned it for um, removal. Uh, and I have been sent this a couple of times for normally it's a nice little neat spot, but I'm going to stick my neck out on this, John, and say it's human and it's paint. 
And uh, you would be 100% correct, Charles. I spent about an hour looking at this one, trying to work out whether it was lichen, fungal, and eventually decided that I didn't realise. And a lady walked past and said, why did they come past last week and paint all our trees with these big orange spots? It was, in the end, the only way that I worked it out was local knowledge, exactly as you said earlier. And what we know of all of you as tree wardens is that you do this, that you do use your skills, you do use your knowledge, you're out there looking, um, you're out there looking at the trees, you're spotting problems. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, the first case of ash dieback in the country was in the wild, was recorded by a tree warden up in Norfolk, which a, a lady called Anne Edwards, who was the first person. So you are, as tree wardens, you are an absolutely invaluable part of this process around the country. And what Charles and I wanted to do tonight was just to give you some of the thoughts that we go through in our head when we deal with some of these problems. But through this um, healthy tree walk that we're developing for you as a pilot, we will be articulating some of this properly so that you can start to, to use those skills over the next few years to actually uh, help to feed into the whole network of plant health. So what I'd like to do now, Charles, is we've got uh, a few questions that we haven't dealt with. So I'm just gonna see if I can work my way through as many as, the, as we can until the end. Um, and if you, if you can answer them, if you can't, we can't. So David in Kent says, um, with all the emphasis on commercial biosecurity systems, do you think there's still gonna be a place for commercial nurseries in the future, especially in regards to sort of grant applications and the whole, how do you think the biosecurity is going to fit with grants in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, as the, the British public are, we're much more interested in UK source plants. I mean, I think that puts the onus on nurseries to try and source as much as possible. They want to do that. And I think industry really has got their head around sort of good biosecurity practice. Um, they led with DEFRA's assistance with the UK Biosecurity Alliance, the Plant Healthy campaign. And DEFRA has also launched a new scheme called Ready to Plant, which Ferra is leading on, and I've been involved in developing that. Um, so there's two ways that uh, industry and businesses can demonstrate how they're complying with good biosecurity practice and going forward for all the England um, Woodland Creation Officer. If you haven't got a Ready to Plant assessment or a plant healthy statement, you won't get grant money. So we can energise the process. But I think as, as buying public, we need to be asking, are these British plants where are they grown and that will make people change their minds if there's a market for it and we're, we're willing to buy and and make the extra effort i think the nursery trade will respond to that they certainly would like to do that and i i think i may have misspoke in my um asking of the question class uh, charles i think there was also the, i said commercial but i should probably have said community nurseries is there do you think there's going to be a space for community nurseries going forward? yeah i mean i think uh, i i work with the humber forest and a lot of the community woodlands you know there is a lot of support from the community to raise and grow their own seed locally source seed they want to grow their own they want to secure their supply chain um i say working with humber forest and and, and pat foundation they 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 are just as interested in ensuring because this is their seed that the community has gathered they have raised on their behalf and they're going to plant back in the community. They want to make sure those plants are going to be healthy. So biosecurity is absolutely key to these people. So I think community woodlands could be a real good drive in making sure that plant health and biosecurity is done to a very high standard. There's an appetite and a market and an enthusiasm for it, definitely. Joe asks, is composted, is compost imported from other places, e.g. Europe? And therefore, is that a risk? And should we be using and importing compost in future? A slightly tricky question, I would say. So uh, if, um, if plant waste comes from um, a site that has had a statutory pest or pathogen, you may compost that waste, but it's done by a commercial uh, company. So composting, if it's done properly, can be very, very effective, but it tends to be composted at 60 degrees and higher for at least a fortnight in a turning system. Very few people can actually achieve that. So compost is potentially, any plant material is potentially a source of pests and pathogens. I don't know about the market and the movement of compost from overseas. It, 
to my mind, it seems unlikely because it's a bulky commodity. Um, it seems unlikely. But, you know, if if plant waste is composted professionally and effectively, it can be very good indeed. Home composting systems don't tend to be very good if you've got pests and pathogens. But for breaking down plant material, it is fine. We have a genuinely intriguing question to which I, I have no idea, Charles. And, but it might play to your, well, it will play to your strengths. Thank you for that. Um, so it's from an ace and uh, they say that there's, there, there's a woodland near them where uh, lots of young trees were, were chopped down over the last couple of years. And that's led to the growth of uh, a whole load of garlic mustard across the site. And they've read that garlic mustard destroys the mycorrhizal networks um, that might, that might cause either health or damage to trees and so they're wondering whether they should get rid of the, the garlic mustard do you know anything about the interrelationship of garlic mustard and good and bad fungi uh i assume garlic mustard is probably going to be an allium species and no, it's, um, it's, it's actually a crucifer oh is it i yeah i i am out of my comfort zone I, I mean allium and garlic has been used as a natural biological control agent um so again i i'm i'm out of my comfort zone i'll be honest with you so i won't proffer an opinion no and i i haven't either it's a question i've never been asked never heard of but i tell you what um charles and i will see if we can find an answer because i think that's one that i'd actually genuinely like like to know the answer for me yeah. if anything else um so we will come back to you on that uh, so um, somebody's asked whether we should report suspected spruce bark beetle markings on trees. Uh, how quickly do they cause problem? And if so, how? So I think I'll answer that one. If you suspect it, definitely. Um, because we, we won't know if we don't know. There is a lot of concern, particularly in the southeast, about spruce bark beetle at the moment. So do, do use the uh, tree alert form to, to, to fill out and do your questions, Charles. Yeah, and again, I would say, if in doubt, report it to Tree Alert. Don't sit on information, oh, I'm not quite sure. Put it onto Tree Alert, it'll go to Forest Research, and then Forest Research can then make a decision based on the evidence you provide. It's much better you tell, and then someone else thinks about it, and then comes back to you. So if in doubt, I would always take that precautionary approach of reporting it. We um, are almost out of time, folks. Um, uh, there's one, one last question, which is um, on AI-based system tracking and land-based sensors to help agriculture, um, and whether they can be used to specifically identify particular fungi, because um, Rick is looking to try and launch a project to do such tracking. Have you seen any sensors that detect specific tree infections or satellite data sets which show infestations? Uh, not specifically for fungal diseases. Obviously, uh, forest research do a lot of aerial surveys by helicopter and by drones to identify symptoms of things like Phytophthora morum, spruce bark beetle. So aerial surveillance is a standard technique in uh, forest research. Uh, and I think if someone has got a research idea, they should be talking to forest research. Uh, and I'm sure they'd be more than interesting to advise and guide on that subject matter. So we come to the end of our allotted slot. Thank you all for, for attending. Uh, somebody asked me a slightly bizarre question, which Charles asked me the other day, which is what this thing over my, over my right hand shoulder. Um, my wife's uncle uh, had, a, had um, a reference collection of woods because he was a master woodmaker. Unfortunately, he's deceased. This thing over my shoulder is little mushrooms, which is suitable for Charles, made out of all of the different types of wood, which was his reference collections when he wanted to match a wood. And it's my homage to, um, to Ken because it is a really beautiful bit of woodwork, but I'm not gonna go and get it because I've got shorts on and that would probably be utterly unprofessional. <laughs> so thank you all for your time this evening. We hope you enjoyed that. We hope we've given you some, some useful tips. Uh, the presentation will be available so that if you want it, you can see it. The Tree Health module will be coming out soon. So thank you all for your time this evening. Thank you for Charles for, for attending and being part of our event. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all somewhere at some time, hopefully in person. Um, and thank you all for being there. Good night. Bye. Thanks very much. <laughs>